This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, from Philadelphia to Erie and from Scranton to Pittsburgh, it's Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenwald, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mara Donnelly. Mara, welcome. Hello, Charlie. Why, uh, what's uh, new in, um, in uh, Pennsylvania state government? Any, uh, uh, any uh, problems with uh, former uh, dating partners and uh, uh, domestic abuse? Are you, are you asking me that? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no well, there's a lot going on. Uh, and I, and I, I keep hearing we're, we haven't heard the last of it. So that's the sad part. I don't know that I've ever read anywhere of any other uh, legislature that's had two uh, legislators who used to date and now one is accusing the other of uh, abuse and gets a protection from abuse order, right. so the other one may not be able to come to work. Well, it, you know, I, th it's a sad distinction to make in the state of Pennsylvania that we that we have that honor of being the only state that has that. <laughs> We're a leader, it's Mara. A, it's sad. We're a leader. <laughs> but Very sad. Uh, something that we haven't been leading in is higher education. Yeah. And to talk about that subject today, we have Ken Mash with us, the president of the Association of the Pennsylvania State College and University Faculty. Ken, welcome back to the show. Charlie Moore, it's great to be here again. Well, we should clarify, we are a leader in higher education. It's the funding that we have an issue with, correct? It, it really is, and it right. creates this kind of weird situation where you have the U.S. News and World Report ranking Pennsylvania 50th That's for what higher I was education. To. Right. But it's 50th, but it's not because of the quality of, right. the, of higher education mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It's really just because of the cost. Uh, the amount of debt that students are carrying with them when they're done, uh, and access generally that we have uh, so many people who can't afford to go. So that's a new new study. We've ranked 47th in other studies. Right. So we're, it's not good. All right, we're 47th when it comes to per capita, per capita. funding mm -hmm. for public higher education. Look, this is a crisis in Pennsylvania. It truly is. If we're going to look at our future, and we see, you know, we have uh, municipalities bidding to have Amazon come. Uh, we want high-tech industries mm -hmm. to come to Pennsylvania. They're not going to want to come to Pennsylvania if we're not educating the workforce here. And uh, there are so many benefits that derive to people from a college degree that it's really kind of insane that we've allowed this to happen. Well, I know we've talked uh, in the past about the decline in uh, funding for um, higher education in Pennsylvania. It goes back, and we're 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 way behind. I mean, we're we're not keeping up with inflation. We're not doing anything right. We're below where we were adjusted for inflation. Below where we were ten years ago. Right. So you know, there was a big cut in 2011. We've never made up for that cut, let alone added on for inflation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the you know, it's really awful for our universities, particularly out in the western part of the state, in the northern tier, uh, the rural parts of the state, and poorer areas in the state where you've got students out there graduating from high school, and we see that they're below the national average in even filling out FAFSA forms. That is, they've get, they don't even try to go oh. to college. And Pennsylvania has, I think uh, Pennsylvania's 40th at this point as far as adults with some, uh, some degree, either from a community college or from a four-year school, it's not a good situation. Well, and then it's compounded, isn't it, Ken, by the fact that uh, when you adjust for inflation, uh, the state system appropriations for higher education are actually at an all-time low. I mean, I want, to over, I want to stress that over and over again. Uh, isn't there an awareness on the Hill uh, of this and uh, the positive effect that higher education has for a state and its economy and jobs? Well, I think that it's mixed. Of course, there are a lot of people in the Capitol building who agree, who think that there's more money that needs to be given to our universities, but of course, there are people there too who are sort of on the attack against, uh, against our universities and have even just I think yesterday there was a newspaper article that one gubernatorial candidate even suggested closing or privatizing our universities. And that just would go entirely in the wrong direction. Well, we, we have need, private universities. We, we have plenty of <laughs> private universities, hmm. but we need to provide an affordable option for Pennsylvanians. The big losers here are the working class Pennsylvanians 
Uh, and that's really why we're so supportive of the Pennsylvania Promise. And, and if they can afford to go at all um, with the decrease in funding, they're pay the students are paying more. They're coming out with higher amounts of debt going into their first you know, careers. Living at home still probably. I'm sure mom and dad are not too happy about that. But it, it's, it's the students themselves are bearing a much greater burden um, yeah, well, if, if they want to... And education. If you're carrying tens of thousands of yeah. dollars of debt as soon as you graduate, then what what money do you have left over to buy a house yeah. or to buy a car or the other things? The burden that we're putting on this generation is incredible, and it seems to me to be really hypocritical for some people who are out there who are okay with the situation when they benefited from a system where they, where the Commonwealth was picking up 75% of the cost almost of their education and now the reverse is true. Yeah. Uh, and it may even be worse than that even at our public universities. Something's got to be done and that's why, like I said, we're excited to do this uh, and to, to, to make the argument for it and to support it because if nobody brings it up, it'll never happen. Well, taking into account everything we've been talking about here, ABSCUF has been one of the leaders in trying to put together a new initiative called the Pennsylvania Promise to address everything we're talking about. Could you tell us exactly what the Pennsylvania Promise is and how it's going to move forward? Yeah, so the Keystone Research Center and the Pub, uh, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center came up with a series of reports looking at our universities, the costs, uh, like I was mentioning before, the failure of students to fill out FAFSA forms and all the rest. And in their last report that they came up, came out with, they made this recommendation for this Pennsylvania Promise. And simply put, what this would do would pay for students whose family incomes are below $110,000. It would pay for tuition and fees at community college. It would pay for students attending one of our universities for the tuition that's set by the Board of Governors and the average amount of fees at those 14 uh, universities. And for those students who are attending one of the state-related schools like uh, Penn State, Temple, Lincoln, and Pitt, it would give them grants equivalent to what students who attended the state-related schools uh, are getting. And it's expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, don't get me wrong, it's expensive. Uh, it would be about a billion dollars uh, to pay for this, but to get some perspective on that, Pennsylvania would go from being 47th in per capita funding. If this was fully funded, it would go up to something like 35th. So hmm. that's how it, it gives you. We, would, we don't even get to the middle. Yeah, right, it gives <laughs> you some indication of just how bad it is here in Pennsylvania right now as far as funding for public higher education and also that this is not a ridiculous proposal. Is this yeah. all that's contained in Senate Bill 1111? Yeah, it's going to be. It hasn't okay. been introduced yet. Okay. Uh, but Senator Hughes has been a big advocate of affordable public higher education, is going to be introducing it in the Senate. Uh, we have a couple of sponsors also in the House, uh, Chairman Roebuck of the Education Committee and uh, Representative Jordan, who is the chair of the Legislative Black Caucus. Uh, they're going to be introducing it, but we've even seen some, we've seen uh, bipartisan support even for this idea. I mean, this is, it's, you know, poverty is not partisan. So, you know, we have people in our rural communities who, if they're going to make those communities better, or if they're going to have a real opportunity, they need to go to college. And it's, you know, again and again and again, these studies come out showing what a difference a degree makes for someone's life not just in terms of money, but also in terms of happiness in their life. So something has got to be done. And frankly, we're excited about doing something positive and fighting for this. And we're hoping that the students will speak up, high school students will speak up, parents will speak up and say, hey, something has to be done. And this is heading down the right path. Well, you say it costs $1 billion. The state has just spent $500 million on a project called Open Skies, which is an attempt to try to let the state police talk to one another. And it has been a massive failure for a number of years. I think during the nickel mine situation, they had to bring in uh, Motorola to set up an old-fashioned 
uh, communication system hmm. so that they could talk to one another uh, reliably and effectively. But if we spend, we waste $500 million on a radio system that hasn't worked from the very beginning, certainly a, bi uh, a billion dollars for something of this magnitude uh, would be uh, understandable. All right. Put that in your talking points. I know. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, you know, obviously, like I said, I don't want to run away from the fact that this is an expensive proposition. But nevertheless, we're talking about our future, and we're talking not just about the future of these of the students who go to these public universities. We're talking about the future of the Commonwealth. Everyone benefits when the, you know people are employed. They're paying taxes. They have good jobs. It makes everybody's life better and easier. So you know we need to really think about what we're doing, <clears throat> and we certainly have to make sure that everybody has at least an opportunity to achieve the American dream. Is there, uh, I didn't see this, uh, is there a website people can go for PA Promise? Yeah, it's www.papromise.org. Pa .org, <laughs> okay, we wanna make sure we put that out there for our, for our viewers right. um, to get more additional information. Now, when is this gonna be acted upon, Ken, uh, on the Hill? Well, that's up, you know, that remains to be seen. <laughs> I know it'll be introduced, but I think it's gonna require people to be active and to ask their legislators do you support this and for people to push to make it happen uh, without people pushing to make it happen uh, it's likely not going to happen but i'm um, i'm excited about that proposition uh, we see now people being more active mm -hmm. and i think that this is something worth fighting for so this pays for tuition and fees it does not pay for room and board it doesn't pay for room and board and it doesn't necessarily fully pay even for tuition and fees so for example at Millersville University, where they have a per credit tuition plan, this would cover what the Board of Governors says the tuition would be, but anything that goes above that would still be the responsible, responsibility of the student. So what we're looking for here is not, you know, I heard it be called free college, but we're really looking at affordable college for people, a reset back to those days when in Pennsylvania and across the country, if you made the grade, if you could meet the admissions requirements, you, you had a go. real opportunity mm -hmm. to go to college. Ken Mash, thank you for being with yeah. us today. Uh, as always, uh, an incredible uh, discussion here, uh, and you've helped the viewers w providing lots of good information, I believe, for the Commonwealth. We'll be right back with some more great information for you on our next segment. Uh, stay tuned. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The Pennsylvania Chamber serves as the frontline advocate for business on Pennsylvania's Capitol Hill by influencing the legislative, regulatory, and judicial branches of state government. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Headlines. On this segment, Maura and I are joined by Bob Latham. Bob is the Executive Director of the Associated Pennsylvania Constructors. Uh, Bob, uh, just for some new viewers who might be with us, will you just give us a quick summary of who the Associated the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Constructors are? Just a, th a thumbnail sketch. Sure, quickly. Charlie and Maura, nice to be here. Nice we, to have you back. We're a, uh, an organization of companies that build roads and bridges in Pennsylvania. So as you travel along the, uh, the highways and roadways uh, throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, those companies and those uh, people who are working to try to make roads safer, uh, smoother, and, uh, and our bridges functional, those are the companies that we represent. Well, we wanted to have you back today because National Work Zone Awareness Week is coming up April 9th to 13th. That's right. And so we thought we'd talk a little bit about work zone awareness and safety, basically. Sure. Um, there's a lot of accidents in work zones, and we're going to try to prevent that. We uh, were very successful a few years ago in passing a, a major transportation funding bill. It's a multimodal bill. Um, 
It had bipartisan support mm -hmm. um, and a lot of uh, effort by members of the, of the General Assembly who had the foresight to understand that infrastructure investment and transportation investment is very important. The uh, highway program, or uh, upgrading our, particularly our state road system, was but one portion of that transportation bill. Um, what we've seen as a result over four years are uh, a very positive impact to, to our highway system here in Pennsylvania. Uh, specifically, one of the issues that we had was our bridge system. Uh, we had a number of, we had the highest number of what we call bad bridges, I call them bad bridges, structurally deficient bridges. Doesn't mean they're going to fall down or they're unsafe, but they need to be repaired, they need to be upgraded. Uh, we cut that inventory from 6,000 to 3,000 over three wow. years. So we've had a very, very market impact very on impressive. the number of bridges that are now, you know, up to snuff, if you will. Uh, we have a number of major projects going on. We just uh, just took bids on the first section of uh, 322 into State College. So once and for all, we'll finally finish that bypass into State College for sure? all those Penn State <laughs> football. Are you sure? Yeah, I would say by the time the, the Nittany Lions win the 2020, 2023 National Championship, there are a lot of football the road will be done. Hoping you're right, Tom. <laughs> so that's a big one. The Central Susquehanna Valley Expressway up in Sealands Grove also spending a lot of time, a lot of money um, repairing I-95 through the, through the Delaware Valley. So that coupled with projects all over the state, uh, we're seeing a lot of benefits from that highway bill. The one thing that we want, want to point out, back to your point about yeah. National Work Zone Awareness Week, mm -hmm. is that for the most part, we're rebuilding or rehabilitating existing roadways which means it has to be done under traffic you can't shut the roadway down and that means highway work zones with motorists passing through and what we're hoping to do is to get people to slow down in mm -hmm. those highway work zones to make it safer for them and the workers who are there and we're heading into prime season for highway work zones because the weather's improving Correct. and it's going to get better so what are some of the ways that um, you hope, your organization hopes, that we will be able to slow people down. We are looking at uh, legislation that uh, was introduced by Senators Argyle and, and Schwank, passed the Senate by uh, a wide margin, Senate Bill 172, which would uh, introduce automated speed enforcement in highway work zones. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is if you speed through a highway work zone, a camera, so to speak, will take a picture of your license plate and send you a fine. We ca just cannot put a state trooper on every work zone throughout the Commonwealth. Just, just PennDOT's projects alone, have over, we have over 600 projects uh, throughout the state. We couldn't put a trooper on each one. Trooper presence, law enforcement presence is what's shown to slow people down through work zones. And so we're adopting, we're hoping the General Assembly will, will enact uh, legislation that has been in Maryland and other states and several other states for a long time, which is simply, uh, as you approach a highway work zone, it'll tell you it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, speed camera enforced. Uh, and you know that if, if it's marked for 55 miles an hour, if you go above 67, you still get a 12 mile an hour grace period that you're gonna get a fine. And that's basically, you, you, we witnessed it in Maryland, it's worked very well, and we're hoping to introduce it here in Pennsylvania. So, passed the Senate, Senate Bill 172, uh, thanks to the leadership of Senator Rafferty, Senator Brown, over in the House Transportation Committee, Chairman Taylor passed it out by a unanimous margin, so it's got bipartisan support, um, and we're hoping that we'll finally get it passed this year. Well, Bob, if great. Pennsylvania is going to use automated, autom automated speed enforcement devices such as Maryland, um, a lot of motorists are going to ask the question, how accurate is this equipment when their speed is being measured? Well, the, uh, the devices are, are, uh, are a technologically proven, um, and uh, they will be uh, monitored by... Uh, by PennDOT and by the other agencies. And uh, there is also, of course, there will be an appeals process that will be available to motorists if they feel that, the, that there's a problem there. 
So they'll do the same type of calibrations that they have to do with all the other speed devices exactly. that they use. They yeah, can't, exactly. They, they can't so let those different, go. No different than radar or anything else. So you mentioned uh, Maryland. What has been the experience in Maryland using these um, speed enforcement? Well, we're zones? happy to say that uh, that the fines in Maryland that the state of Maryland has issued are uh, a lot less than when they started. So in other words, what happened was when the program was first introduced, there was a level and, it's, and it just continues to decline each year. So that means people, people are slowing down. People are slowing down, down. exactly. <laughs> you know, somebody That's said good. to me one time, well, gee, uh, you know, I don't like the idea of, of, of possibly getting a, uh, a fine for speeding oh. through a work zone. And I said, there's a very simple solution to that. Don't, Don't speed. speed. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, slow down. Cause, you know, we've seen, uh, the, the, we have seen speeds as high as 110 miles an <gasps> hour through some of the, one of the work zones out oh in Pittsburgh. Um, we had a, a kind of a lengthy uh, project out on uh, the Turnpike in Blue Mountain, <laughs> multiple 70, 75 mile an hour hits to the, uh, to the uh, uh, impact attenuators out there. Um, it's just <coughs> devastating to have uh, either injuries or fatalities to workers. But the other thing is, you know, most of the risk is to yourself and the other motorists when you don't slow down through those work zones. Because in many cases, there's a lane shift. There's a, you know, it, it, the, the, it's not the same roadway condition that you're on, and it's very dangerous to be going at a high rate of speed through those, to those areas. So well, it's not just about workers. Correct. Well, and I think, Bob, the, the statistics that you and your organization have compiled show that uh, motorists should be very concerned about uh, driving through these work zones because when there is an accident, uh, I believe your organization showed that 80% of the time it is the motorist that's going to be uh, injured or killed. Charlie, that's uh, well, that's the exact point. Is you know, this is this is a highway safety issue. We're obviously in this because we have people who work very hard day in and day out, uh, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, who are working on roads and they deserve a safe environment and they deserve to come home at night and that's why we want to slow people down. Um, if, you've ever had to, if you've ever had to pull over by the side of a major roadway and experience what it feels like to have traffic go by you at at a high rate of speed, you understand what they work under, what their work environment is like every every day. Uh, so from that standpoint, that's where our interest is. But the point is, it's also a safety it's a safety issue for everybody driving on highways. Hmm. Well, I uh, my Easy Pass wasn't working one time when I was driving through New Jersey, and uh, they found me, sent me a, sent me a fine. And I was, I was able to rectify it by sending in my transponder, you know, right. number, and it was fine. But they found me. But people worry so much about privacy, invasion of privacy. Is that an issue here with um, the speed enforcement zones? I think some of the opposition has been uh, based on concerns for invasion of privacy. You're right. Um, but with technology today, you know, we look at this as somewhat of a specious argument. Anybody with a cell phone, you don't have particular no. Somebody's collecting if your data. If, like I said, if you have easy pass, they, they kind of know e where you are. <laughs> well, they were going, you know, the turnpike is going to uh, all automated uh, tolling here uh, rapidly. Where they're going to take the license plate? Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm talking but, about you'll have to have an easy pass to use the turnpike. Oh, okay. Because I know in some cases they're going to start doing it based on license plates as well. It could be. In some segments of the state. So, so. the point is you're you're using automated uh, for, for tolling, um, I believe not to get a, a, a field of the, of the topic, but at some point we're going to be moving away from the gas tax or a consumption-based tax for funding highways and funding transportation to some other form, which will probably be a mileage fee, which we'll use technology anyways. So um, we're using uh, technology when there is a state trooper holding a gun, yeah. you know, uh, a speed gun, yeah. and this is just another form of it. Well, it's interesting because some uh, good government groups uh, object to having the government take a picture of their license plate. But what's more important, uh, your privacy and not having your license plate uh, photographed or the uh, ability of a, 
of a, a worker, uh, a highway worker, to uh, um, make it through the day uh, without being uh, without being injured and be able to go home safely to their family. That's a position that we're taking, Charlie. You're absolutely right. Um, it's really not that inconvenient to, to to drive the speed limit through a highway work zone. And guess what? If you do, nobody's taking a picture of your license plate. Well, yeah. generally, I, think, <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to defer to our, our photography crew, but I think they've told us over time that uh, anything that's out in public can be photographed. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the arguments against that seem to be fairly weak. Right. Well, it sounds like it's moving uh, smooth, relatively smoothly. Nobody's yelling about this being a money grab by the state or... Uh, you know, any, any well, that's a good pushback on this? There's been some opposition from uh, along that line, but uh, we're, our, the fiscal note attached to the bill is $21 million the first year. The fine in the current version of the bill is $40 per occurrence. Uh, we actually calculate that the, in order to um, manage and operate the system, it's going to cost, it's going to take a fine of a little north of $40. Mm -hmm. So I don't see that this is going to be a, uh, a big revenue source for the Department of Transportation or for the state police. But hopefully it will be a disincentive to, or in, an incentive to slow down. Uh, I like the incentive. Yeah, incentive, to yes. Disincentive to speed. <laughs> yes, it's the the wrong one. <laughs> slow down. Good. Wrong but, way. Uh, if the bill passes, uh, Bob, it is supposed to be a pilot program. Uh, in the last 45 seconds that we have here, um, what would the pilot? Why is it called a pilot program? What would the pilot program? Called a pilot of? program because basically we're going to take a five-year period in order to study the results of it, and uh, okay. uh, and it has a sunset provision. So if any of these issues that uh, that uh, some uh, uh, some of the few people that have raised an opposition to it come to light, the bill will not be. It has to be renewed by the by the General Assembly in five years. So we'll have an opportunity to see what the results are. Are is it is it accurate? Is it slowing people down? Are there technology problems? Are there privacy problems or things like that? We don't think there will be. But by having it be a pilot project and with us with what we call a sunset so that it has to be renewed and studied before it uh, goes on in perpetuity. Okay, Bob, we want to thank you, uh, you for bet. joining Mar and me today and talking about this. And uh, I guess it would be appropriate now to wish all our viewers happy motoring. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>